Let us turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 32 to 34. And John bear record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So today we are coming to the portion which talks about the anointing of the Lord Jesus. And that was significant particularly for John the Baptizer to confirm that Jesus is a Messiah. Jesus is indeed God because the voice from the heaven testified to John the Baptizer that he is the Son of God, he is the Messiah. But this anointing, we cannot just study it separately. When we study what happened here, it's mentioned here, when we read these verses, we can plainly understand what happened. The Spirit descended from heaven like a dove and it abode, it stayed above Lord Jesus. And then a voice also testified that he is the beloved son. Lord Jesus he is the beloved son whom the Lord sent to redeem us, whom the Lord sent as our mediator. So that voice also came from heaven. But then this descending of the Tao, we cannot study it separated from what happened uh, in relation with the baptism of Lord Jesus. When we look at the parallel passages in the Gospel accounts, we can see this descending of the Tao happened when John baptized Lord Jesus. So if we turn to Matthew chapter 3 verses 13 to 17, then this is very important in relation to the meditation of these verses. The book of John. So let us turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 13 to 17, so that we can understand the context in a better way. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan and to John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now. And thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like dove and lighting upon him. So this is the same we read in the Gospel of John. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So this descending of Tao, we need to study in the context of what is happening here. Jesus took baptism from John the baptizer. So already if you listen to the previous sermons, I already explained to all of you that the baptism administered by John the baptizer is not the same like how we take baptism. Our baptism is Christian baptism, instituted and commanded by Lord Jesus. After his resurrection, he commanded the disciples to go and baptize in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. So that is the beginning of the new covenant baptism. And that's how you all are baptized and made part of the church, made members of the church. But when the John the baptizer is baptizing, it is still in the old covenant. It is an old covenant baptism, not like the Christian baptism that we do. And particularly John baptized many who were also Gentiles who came to faith. And when Jesus is taking baptism, we also need to understand it is also an old covenant baptism. Jesus' baptism is not like our baptism or not like others who took baptism from John. 
John the Baptist has said, right? It is a baptism of repentance. He were calling people to repent and believe in the promised Messiah. Then he baptized those who came forward. It's a baptism of repentance. But Jesus don't need to take that baptism of repentance, right? Why? Because Jesus never committed any sin. Not like us. Not like others who came to join the baptizer to get baptized. They were sinners. They need to repent of their sins. And they need to go under these waters. And also they have to put their faith in the Lord Jesus. But Jesus is God. He never commits any sin. He is sinless. And why he has to go and take baptism from John the baptizer. So there is a special significance for Jesus baptism. And also it's very important. We can see the Lord providentially prepared Jesus and he waited till the age of 30. If you read other parallel passages in the book of Luke or in other gospel accounts, we can see Jesus got baptized at the age of 30, right? So in our churches, if somebody says they want to be baptized, will we ask them to wait till the age of 30? Then we will baptize you? No, right? We don't do that. There is some special significance. And what is happening here is, Jesus is beginning his public ministry. We know Jesus started his public ministry at the age of 30. This has some connection, some relation to the inauguration of the public ministry of Lord Jesus. And when we look at the Old Testament passages, we can see how significant it is. In Matthew itself, in the portion which we read, John the Baptist initially said, No, I don't want to baptize you. Then Jesus said, You should do. Why? To fulfill all righteousness. That's what Jesus said. Please do baptize me to fulfill all righteousness. So why Jesus got baptized? Jesus himself gave the answer. Not because he needed to repent of his sins. Not to show that he is exercising faith. That somehow, you know, in the modern church contest, sometimes people like to say that, oh, because I have faith as a testimony to that faith, I take baptism. No, that's not the purpose for which Jesus is taking baptism. So when we look at the Old Testament scriptures, we can understand what did Jesus meant by that word when he said to fulfill all righteousness. What does that word mean? This word is used in various parts of the scripture. So whenever the Bible uses this term to fulfill all righteousness, it means to fulfill the demands of the law. So the law demands us. So we need to obey that. So Jesus is asking John the baptizer to baptize him to fulfill the demands of the law. Which law? The laws in the Old Covenant. Laws in the Old Testament. Clearly shows there were some baptisms demanded by the law in the Old Testament. And Jesus is taking that baptism. And I already mentioned it has some connection with the inauguration of the public ministry of Lord Jesus. So what we see in the Old Testament law concerning the inauguration of a certain office where a baptism is also administered to show the inauguration of a certain public ministry, a certain public office in the Old Covenant. We can see this particularly when the priest enter into the ministry. If you go to the book of Numbers, chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, let us go to that portion. Numbers chapter 4 verses 1 to 3. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, 
take the sum of the sons of Kohath from among the sons of Levi, after their families, by the house of their fathers, from thirty years old and upward, even until fifty years old, all that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. So here we can see some are set apart for the ministry in the temple at what age? At the age of thirty. So that's the time where the priests officially start their full responsibilities as priests. And then what are the other requirements mentioned for the priests to start their office? Let us turn to Exodus chapter 29 verse 1 to 4. Exodus chapter 29 verses 1 to 4. Exodus 29 reading from verse 1 and this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hallow them to minister unto me in the priest's office take one young bullock and two rams without blemish and unleavened bread and cakes unleavened tempered with oil and the wafers unleavened anointed with oil of wheaten flour thou shalt make them and thou shalt put them into one basket and bring them to the basket with the bullock and the two rams and Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and wash them with what? So at the age of 30, these priests are set apart, consecrated for the ministry in the temple and then they are brought to the door of the temple and then they are baptized with water. They are washed with water. That's why in Hebrews, when you study the book of Hebrews, the author uses the same word, same Greek word for various washings in the Old Testament. It is a baptism done in front of the door of the temple when the priests start their ministry at the age of 30. So they were washed with water. And Numbers 8 verse 7 also particularly talks about how the water is administered or how the washing is done. We already heard they have to be washed with water. So if you come to Numbers chapter 8 verse 7, there it says, And thus shalt thou do unto them to cleanse them, sprinkle water of purifying upon them, and let them shave all their flesh, and let them wash their clothes, and so make themselves clean. So how that baptism was done, how that washing was done, those who entered into the priesthood ministry at the age of 30, they were brought to the door of the tabernacle and water was sprinkled upon them. And it don't end there. Let us turn back to the book of Exodus, chapter 29, verse 7. There is another thing happening here. There is an anointing with the oil. Let us turn to the book of Exodus again, chapter 29, verse 7. It says, Then shalt thou take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. So at the age of the 30, those who want to enter into the priesthood ministry, they were brought to the door of the temple. They were baptized with water, sprinkled with water. And then they were also anointed with oil. By the way, just a side note, this is one of the reasons why Presbyterians baptized by sprinkling. Don't think that it is unbiblical. This is the biblical way to do baptism. This is the way all the baptisms were done in the Old Testament. It's not something new. And I'm sure even John the baptizer also, when he baptized Jesus, he didn't immerse him. If he immerse, he is violating what the law says. In Numbers 8, 7, it very clearly says, the water must be sprinkled upon the person who take baptism. We have to assume John as a prophet who is supposed to uphold the law, particularly Jesus, Jesus never violated any commandment of the law. So we have to assume according to the commandments given in the Old Testament, John baptized him and most likely it was similar like how the baptisms were done in the Old Testament. It was by the sprinkling of water upon the priest or the person who is taking baptism. 
And as I mentioned, not only that, there is an anointing with oil. And what does that signify? When the anointing is done with the oil to these new candidates for ministry, for the priesthood ministry, that signifies that the Holy Spirit will give them all the help required for their service in the tabernacle. The Spirit will give them the gifts for their service. So this anointing with the oil, you can study even other portions in the Old Testament, which talks about the anointing with oil. It talks about the empowerment given by the Holy Spirit. The anointing given by the Holy Spirit. And the oil signifies that. And even when kings or other officers, when they appoint, they do anoint them with oil. To show that these men are gifted and the Spirit will empower them. The Spirit will give them the necessary gifts to serve in the temple or serve in the public office that the Lord is calling them to do. Here at least we can see two things. Jesus is taking this baptism at the age of 30, similar like how the priest took. Of course, John also baptized Jesus by applying water. So according to the Old Testament law, it must be through the sprinkling of the water and he did that. But we don't see an anointing with the oil. But there we see the real descent of the Holy Spirit himself upon him. That's why John didn't anoint him with the oil. Because the oil signified the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And in this case, when John the baptizer baptized Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit himself descended. And testified to John that he is the Messiah. He is a priest who is going to come to take away our sins. The Lamb who take away the sins of the world. That's what John was preaching all this time. A person is going to come. He will lay down his life as a priest. A person will come and do the ultimate sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins. And when the Spirit descended, John the Baptist understood, Oh, he is the one. He is the priest. He is the Lamb who is going to take away my sins. He is the Lamb who is going to take away the sins of the whole world. All those who believe in him and in his work. And even in the Old Testament we can see after they are baptized, after they are anointed with the oil, we can see a benediction being announced even in Numbers and in other portions. We can see the people who are entering into the priesthood, they are baptized, they are anointed with oil and then we can see Moses pronouncing a benediction or a benediction is announced upon them showing that the Lord's blessing is upon them. That is also part of the inauguration of the priesthood ministry. A benediction is announced upon the candidate for the ministry who is called and separated for the priesthood ministry. And when John the baptizer baptized Lord Jesus, we also see the Lord giving a divine benediction from above. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And if you come to the book of Hebrews, we can see a clear verse talking about this. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5. Let us turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son. Today have I begotten thee. So Christ became a priest. And at that time, a divine voice from heaven testified that this is my beloved son. And when it happened, the author of the Hebrews is saying, Jesus entered into the priesthood ministry. And from heaven, it was testified of him that he is my son. He is my beloved son. Of course, when we compare scripture with scripture, we can clearly see during the baptism administered by John the baptizer, this happened. A voice from heaven also testified that 
he is my beloved son and it is interesting in the old testament this is normally done by other priests so when young priests come to the ministry the baptism is done by other priests think about john john is not only a prophet john comes in the priestly line his father is a priest and he is eligible to do this what a great plan of god where lord prepared this man as a prophet and a, as a priest to administer this baptism and to call and separate lord jesus to the priest a special priesthood ministry a priesthood in the order of melchizedek we read in hebrews right so here jesus is submitting to the laws of the old covenant to inaugurate to start his public ministry as a priest why it is relevant for us why it is important that lord jesus must submit to these laws of the old testament why it is important that he must submit to the baptism of john the baptizer why it is important that he must be anointed and the spirit must descend and testify that he is my beloved son he can just start the ministry without all these maybe we can call it as formalities or all these strict laws of the old covenant but it has great significance it has great significance for our salvation this is very important for us to understand we are not only saved by the death of jesus on the cross we are saved because christ obeyed the law perfectly every jot and tittle of the law if he didn't obey the law of god that's why he was circumcised that's why he was baptized that's why he had to submit to the law he fulfilled all righteousness and started his public ministry in this way he submitted to the demands of the law so that he will obey all the laws on our behalf all these laws were given to the israelites but they have failed to fulfill the laws even the priests who entered the priesthood ministry they were terrible sinners they continued to live in their sin they disobeyed the law of god they didn't fulfill the demands of the law they failed in obeying the law of god and here comes a great high priest for us who obeyed the law perfectly and because of his active obedience of the law from birth till death and even he rose again from the dead because of that we are saved and that's why he submitted himself to be baptized by john the baptizer and from the heaven the lord testified that he is the son of god he is god who became man this is a clear place in the scripture where we can see jesus is standing there in his human nature and john the baptizer baptizes him and the, from the voice from heaven the lord is saying he is the son of god he is god man he is the mediator he is the prophet priest and king who is going to save us from our sins for oh, there is no other way we can be saved christ is the only mediator only through him we can find salvation he is the priest who obeyed all the laws perfectly he is the priest who don't require another sacrifice a sinless priest he is the priest who don't go and confess his own sins but he intercedes for us on behalf of us he obeyed the law on behalf of us the word of the lord says he sits at the right hand of god and intercedes for us he prays for us as a priest what a great privilege we have as christians so this inauguration of the public ministry of the lord jesus as a mediator of the new covenant as the prophet as the priest as a king is very important particularly his ministry as the priesthood as a priest is very important for our salvation 
do you believe in lord jesus do you believe that he is the priest who laid his life as a sacrifice for my salvation do you consider him only as the one and only mediator you know there are many churches especially roman catholic church in their theology they have many mediators they do pray to mary they consider that she is also a mediator the bible very clearly says only christ truly fulfilled the requirements of a mediator he became a priest he laid his life for us in the seats for us he is a prophet who brought god's word to us he is the king of kings and the lord of lords only he is the true mediator and everything he did in his earthly ministry was in obedience to the law of god he never violated a single commandment in the scriptures and all of that has significance to our salvation so we are not only saved by the death of the lord jesus christ by the sacrifice the ultimate sacrifice on the cross of the lord jesus christ we are also saved by the life of lord jesus christ whereby he did everything required for our salvation i was recently reading book of common prayer which is commonly used by the anglican church and there is something called litany which which is supposed to be recited every sunday wednesday and friday and there some truths are said and then the people will respond god lord deliver us in the litany and these are some statements which caught my attention particularly today morning especially as i was also preparing for the sermon and here it says by the mystery of thy holy incarnation by thy holy nativity and circumcision by thy baptism fasting and temptation good lord deliver us by thy agony and bloody sweat by thy cross and passion by thy precious death and burial by thy glorious resurrection and ascension and by the coming of the holy ghost good lord deliver us so it's interesting they are not only saying lord deliver us because of the death and resurrection of the lord jesus christ they are saying oh his incarnation his nativity circumcision his baptism his fasting his temptation all the things that he did in obedience to the law of god has significance in relation to our salvation lord deliver us because christ did all this for me this must bring much comfort to us when we look at our own life or when we look at the commandments in the scriptures the laws in the scriptures we do fall short of it we commit sin in every day of our life we are unworthy people we are wicked people we live in a sinful world we cannot fulfill the demands of the law but thank god we have hope in lord jesus we have hope in this mediator who is the son of god who came and did everything required for our salvation and this is the point of inauguration of his ministry where the spirit descended and the heavenly father also pronounced his divine benediction and also it's a beautiful passage which talks about Trinity. How wonderful it is to see all the three persons in the Trinity in action. Lord Jesus Christ baptized by John the Baptist, the Holy Spirit descending like thou. Heavenly Father pronouncing his divine benediction upon the Son. To our salvation is a work of. a triune god and indeed in him we can have full hope he finish his work he inaugurated his public ministry as a priest and he perfectly finished it by his perfect sacrifice on the cross for the remission of all our sins so dear congregation as a church let us put our trust let us put our hope in lord jesus christ and his finished work 
let us find comfort in the fact that he as a priest fulfilled all the demands of the law and he is truly god man the son of god who came to this earth to save us and in him we have full salvation in him we can find peace and comfort <laughs>